We're getting the scoop on every big NFL story with insider Ian Rappaport, an attorney with vast experience defending athletes in disputes around scoring and eligibility, provides his insight on Jordan Child's situation. We are from Atlanta Dream senior VP Dan Gad, and an NHL team is for sale. It's Thursday, August 15th. Happy birthday, Rachel. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, we have Ian Rappaport on to talk about who holds the leverage in NFL contract holdouts, private equity entering the league, and plenty more. Howard Jacobs, a top lawyer when it comes to disputes like the one Jordan Childs is in over her bronze medal, gives his take on that situation. We hear about life inside a WNBA front office with Atlanta Dream exec Dan Gad in conversation with my colleague Colin Salau. And one of the most anticipated new venues in U.S. sports opens today, and a $100 million racket sports facility is on the way. Also, Dr. Dre wants in on the 2028 Olympics as an athlete. First, let's hit some headlines. Former NBA player Royce White has officially won the GOP Senate primary in Minnesota. White, a former first round pick, only played three total NBA games in his career, largely due to mental health issues related to his anxiety and fear of flying. White lost the GOP primary for a House seat in 2022, but will now face off against longtime Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar this November. Hard Knocks returned on Tuesday night, but with a snag a one-hour delay for streaming customers. Cable viewers were able to watch the season debut on time at 9 p.m. Eastern, but those relying on the Max app had to wait patiently after the company's official account said the episode would be available soon. It ended up dropping on the streaming platform one hour later, but not before fans expressed thorough outrage on social media. The Tampa Bay Lightning have started their sale process, which evaluates the team at $2 billion. Although the deal is not complete yet, reporting suggests that Doug Osterberg, the founder of Blue Owl Capital, will be the team's eventual new owner. Current owner Jeff Vinnick is expected to stay in control of the operational side of the team for the next several seasons. He bought the team for $170 million in 2010. The Lightning won back-to-back Stanley Cups in 2020 and 2021. DraftKings overturned its controversial decision to charge a winning tax in four states next year after a large outcry from bettors across the country. The change comes shortly after FanDuel announced that it would not impose new fees on customers and would instead reduce marketing and bonus offers in higher tax states. French prosecutors are investigating Algerian boxer Eman Khalif's claims of aggravated cyber harassment over her gender during the Olympic Games. In the lawsuit filed this week, Khalif specifically named high-visibility celebrities like Elon Musk, J.K. Rowling, and Donald Trump, who use their platforms to spread false narratives about Khalif's gender status that have racked up hundreds of millions of views. Nabil Boudi, who is representing Khalif, said, We're asking that the prosecution investigates not only these people, but whoever it feels necessary. If the case goes to court, they will stand trial. The NFL preseason is underway, and we have a number of high-profile holdouts, a big rule change making its debut, and structural changes on the horizon as private equity gets closer to entering the league. I spoke about all of that and more with Ian Rappaport, who you can see every weekday at 7 Eastern on the NFL Network's The Insiders. And that conversation is next. I'm joined now by NFL Network insider Ian Rappaport. Welcome, Ian. What's going on, man? How are you? Great. Great to have you back on. Um, So the NFL season approaches. We have a few contract holdout situations that I want to hit on before we get into some broader topics. I guess let's start with Hassan Reddick. Feels like someone's overplaying their hand here. Is is he eventually just going to suit up for the Jets? I mean, that's the most likely outcome, especially because when he requested a trade, the Jets came right out and were like, yeah, we're not trading you. Um, and so my, I would say probably what I don't know is how it's actually going to happen. And I think there are several different options. You know, people will say like, you know, well, well, obviously, um, you know, the Jets have all the leverage. And I'm like, they sort of do, but the player has leverage too because he's very good. And so the team wants him back, but the team also wants him to play on the field He wants to play, but he wants the money. So, like, there has to be some middle ground of, like, how can they compensate him at a level he wants while getting him there in time to contribute to the regular season? And, like, covering stuff in training camp is it's a lot of fun, and I think training camp in general is a lot of fun. But it's also a little frustrating because we all, people who cover news, and fans, people who want things to happen good for their team, we want it to happen right now. But the real deadline is only, like, two weeks from now, or maybe three weeks. So like there's something that's going to happen with Hassan Reddick um, that will probably put him on the field for the Jets. But my guess is it's not just, okay, you have to play for us. We're giving you zero money. Like that's to me, the least likely thing that'll happen. 
So yeah, might as well hit on the other ones. We got Brendan Ayuk um, and C.D. Lamb, who's has this weird kind of public back and forth with Jerry Jones. Um, how do you see those kind of shaking out? Yeah, well, I would say, first of all, with C.D. Lamb, you know, and with Brandon Ayuk, too, we are constantly reminded that we are in a little bit of a different time, right? And it's good. I'm here for this. But everybody has a say, and everybody has social media. And whether it's, you know, C.D. Lamb tweeting out LOL after Jerry Jones said there's no urgency, or whether it's Brandon Ayuk jumping in the comments of an Instagram post and being like, yeah, I'm just going to have my say. Like, players are not, you know, seen but not heard. A lot of times they're not seen but heard plenty, especially during these, you know, holdouts or contentious situations. Like they they have a voice, they have a say, and a lot of times they will make it known. And that's really different because when I was kind of growing up in this, and I'm, you know, my first, you know, eight or so years doing this, it wasn't like that. Players would disappear and then they would show up be like, oh, everything's done. It's like now they have loud megaphones and they like to use them. And sometimes that can you know, dictate or determine where the contracts go. Um, so I would say with CeeDee Lamb, you know, that seems like, you know, I'm not saying they're there yet at all. Um, but I would say, you know, that's one that probably makes sense for it to get done. And the Cowboys always take a little bit of time to to get these things handled. They got the Dak situation. They got the CD situation. You know, my guess is CD gets done eventually. Dak is a little more of a question mark because he could just say, I'm good. I'm just going to go to free agency and I'll make $70 million next year and be the highest profile free agent in the history of the league. Um, with Brandon Ayuk, you know, this has been some, some, you know, plenty of turns, right? It's a time we thought maybe he's going to the Browns. Maybe he's going to the Patriots. Maybe he's going to the Steelers. Oh wait, no, maybe he's staying with the 49ers to a big contract. And now I would say it's like, there's the Steelers deal that's done here. There's a contract that's not done, but the 49ers are working on it. One of those things will probably work out. I just can't tell you 100% right now which one it's actually going to be. Does that really change the the dynamics? I mean, can they make the team look bad? Or, yeah. you know, how does that um, put more pressure on, on the team, you know, as opposed to years past? Well, it actually puts pressure on everyone because it puts pressure on the team because, you know, team makes a low ball offer to sort of get – you know, get conversations going. We'll just make a low offer. Maybe he'll take it. Player could come right on social media and be like, what is this? Why did you do, you know, like this is a low offer. Like you can embarrass the team pretty quickly. Teams have to be cognizant of that. Um, so I think that's one thing. The other thing is for us, you know, I'll talk to sources who are very involved in, you know, the situation and they could tell me one thing. And then if it's not accurate, if it's not balanced, if it's not well-sourced, player could come out and go, that's wrong. And that never used to happen. Those conversations would happen behind the scenes. Now it's like they can happen and we see it happen. Players will call reporters all the time. Um, and I think it's all good because there should be a very high standard for reporting. Um, but it certainly is a different time. Do you feel players are sometimes, I mean, obviously they can't negotiate with teams when they're under contract with, with, with a different team, but they, can they kind of like negotiate in public just by saying like, this is not the offer I want. Like I want to get paid more. Do you feel like that's going on too? Yeah, they can. Um, but you know, it has to, and I, I think that happens, but for players, they will have to know, like, if you are the one out there, if you are sort of negotiating your contract in public, if you're calling a team out for a bad offer, like it's going to get, it's going to get hard. Fans will come after you. Fans generally side with the team in contract negotiations. Not always. There's definitely exceptions, but they usually side with the team. And if you're a player who's holding out for more money, even if you have a great case, even if you deserve all of the money, fans still get angry. So if you're out there as sort of the face of your negotiations, fans can get angry and you have to be willing to deal with that. And like, just like everything else, that comes on social media so players can for sure see it. We've got the new kickoff rule coming in. We've saw, you know, a little bit of it in the preseason so far. How do you think this is going to change, you know, the game itself, but also like which players are more valuable now? I really, really like it. I I'm a, yeah. I'm a huge fan of the kickoff. Um, it's been kind of a bummer the last couple of years when like teams just. Yeah, it. it's basically it's gone. Good. Yeah. It's yeah. like you stop paying attention. Then it's like, all right, when the drive starts, we'll pay attention again. Um, this is better. Now, it looks a little weird, but that's OK. Like our yeah. brains are 
adaptable enough yeah. that we can say this thing that used to look weird now looks normal because we see it all the time. Like my guess is we'll get used to it. Yeah. By week 10, this will look normal. Yeah. Yeah. Or like week two. And then the right, other thing, right. you know, the other thing we'll see is like, we'll see players wearing guardian caps, which is weird, mm-hmm. except it's not that weird. And if it's better for someone's brain, someone's overall yeah. health, I'm for sure for it. And like, at some point, if like Jonathan Taylor was a guardian cap, he's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Like are a bunch of other young running backs going to go, you know what? That guy's kind of cool. Maybe I should also wear it because I want to. And because that guy does it. And then it's sort of like, we'll get used to that too. Um, and this is all, you know, this is all good and this is all better. And I think for the overall product and for overall safety, uh, I think it's going to be sort of mutually beneficial. Yeah. Well, on the topic of overall product, is is the chain gang, uh, is it is it going to be gone pretty soon? Are we going to VAR? I don't know. Um, it has not been perfect. Um, I, you know, the, the chain gang is something that like, you know, sort of like the kickoff, like I'm used to seeing. Um, and so, um, you know, I would say it's, it would be weird if they didn't exist, but if it makes the game better and faster, like if the, the line on the TV suddenly became official, then I would say that's pretty cool. And I'd be good with that just because it would be better and faster. Yeah. I feel like it's one of those things where once it's gone, you won't really miss it. Even if you can have some nostalgia for it, it's like. Everything's faster nowadays. You know, like tennis has a great replay system, for instance, mostly because, you know, I think it's accurate, but like, honestly, who the heck knows? Like it could be for sure not accurate. We have no, I mean, it's like, ball misses by this much is like is that really true like who knows but it is fast and we like fast another big topic private equity is coming to the nfl eventually it's taking a little while but all signs point toward that happening do you see this basically as a financial story and it you know ultimately matters most to the owners um and not so much to everyone else or is is this gonna like trickle down into how teams operate i don't think it'll trickle down into how teams operate um because teams have a lot of cash anyway and I feel like the teams who don't have a lot of cash probably aren't going to be the teams that, I mean, not that there's even a lot of those teams, but um, they're probably not going to be the ones that'll take on those investments, take on those investors. Um, I just think with the, the price getting so high and, you know, I mean, there was a valuation that just came out and honestly, like I never quite can tell what any of that really means, honestly. Um People think it's accurate, but like, you know, there's no way to actually like, how do you value the Cowboys infinite? Like if they were actually on the market, couldn't even guess what the price would be. I don't maybe couldn't even count that high. So like, what do those valuations mean? I have no idea. Um, People seem to think they're real, but I I really don't know. Um, But because of that, you know, taking on, you know, sort of opening the door to private equity makes sense because it'll help get the value to probably where it should be. Right. Yeah. I mean, we if the Cowboys or even just, you know, pick an NFL team, you know, the next one that goes on the market under the current rules, there's only a handful of people who both want an NFL team and would be able to afford it with these rules. So, yeah, lessening that burden a little bit, uh, both right. bringing in private equity, but also, you know, maybe tweaking the ownership rules around, you know, how much the principal owner has to put up might be a good idea. Yeah. Now, the NFL has, you know, it's different from from baseball and some other places where like, you know, the principal owner really has to be the the, the person who owns the team. Um, and I, th- I don't think that's changing, but I do think kind of widening the pool a little bit will help increase the value and get it to a place where it should be. It's like sports betting in the NFL. I mean, it feels like almost like, you know, like this is just now part of everything. Obviously it's not in every state and it's not in some, some of the biggest States, but do you have anything to, to say on this, like the state of like the NFL's relationship to sports betting and to the sports books? Like, have we kind of reached some level of equilibrium here? Uh, feels like that. It feels like it has steadied a little bit. Um, and, you know, maybe like, I don't know where, like it's it, for, for us um, and for other networks, like it's woven into some of our shows, um, not at a crazy level. Um, but enough to where, like, if you are a gambler and you watch our shows, you will get an idea of where certain things stand from a gambling standpoint. I don't know what people expected. Um, and I don't know, you know, I think when you legalize something and like, 
the gam- the legalization of gambling was slow. It was slow, and then it was really fast, um, like sort of all at once. It felt like, um, and I don't know what people thought it was going to be like, but really, it just kind of like got quickly woven into the fabric of what we do, and now it's just kind of part of it. Like I don't get the sense it's gone crazy. I don't get the sense, you know, regular people are just gambling like nuts. I think it's just people who did fantasy kind of now do that as well. And it's pretty recreational and it's pretty stable and it increases interest in football. Um, And I like football a lot and I like when people watch it um, and I like when people care about it. And so I think it's, I think it's at a pretty good place right now. Um, And then, you know, the other part of it is when players have been caught having some association with it or gambling themselves or whatever it is, um, the penalties have been extremely strict um, and I'm for sure for that. Um, and, you know, I think hopefully that acts as the kind of deterrent that it needs to. Uh, give me one thing you're excited about heading into the season. <sighs> the young quarterbacks. Um, I think we are at, you know, for a while it seemed like we didn't have an influx of new quarterbacks. It was just kind of like drip, drip, drip. And now we're like we have six, six first rounders. They're not all going to play. Um, for sure, J.J. McCarthy won't at least to start the season. Um, I don't think Drake may will start, but there's some that are, I think, really exciting. And, you know, like Caleb Williams could hit the ground running. Jane Daniels could hit the ground running. Um, Bo Nix could potentially be the starter in Denver. Like there's some, there is a whole new crop of young, fun, exciting quarterbacks that I'm looking forward to getting to know, like as a football watching public. Um, And, you know, so much of, why we watch. I mean, the quarterback is the most recognizable figure. So having just a really good young crop of quarterbacks is just awesome. Um, so I'm kind of excited for that this season. All right. Sounds good. Ian Rappaport, thank you so much for joining us on the show. All right. Thanks for having me, man. Snoop Dogg was, for many people, the star of the Paris Olympics. And now his longtime collaborator, Dr. Dre, is ready for his moment. As the games head to LA in 2028, the Compton-based rapper wants to be one of the competitors. And no DJing is not coming to the Olympics. Dr. Dre is secretly one of the better archers you know. In fact, he's been shooting the bow since junior year of high school, and now he's eager to bring that to the Olympic stage. In an interview with Entertainment Tonight, Dre said that he was trying to try out for the Olympics in 2028, and that he was being dead-ass serious about it. He added that he felt confident after hearing the Olympic qualification was 77 feet because he practices at 90. And Dre isn't just doing it for the participation trophy. Quote, wouldn't that be interesting to go, especially with it being in LA and winning the gold medal? Caitlin Clark brushed off reporters asking about her interest in joining Unrivaled, an off-season three-on-three league for WNBA players that will begin in 2025. The league, founded by Brianna Stewart and Nafisa Collier, will feature young stars like Angel Reese and Paige Beckers, who is going to play in 2026, in addition to established big-name players like Kelsey Plum and Jewel Lloyd. With Reese's intent to play, eyes have flipped to Clark, who is substantially favored over Reese in the odds for Rookie of the Year. When reporters asked Clark about her interest, she offered a cryptic answer, saying, One thing at a time. Can't always just be moving on to the next. My focus is right here. The fight over Jordan Child's bronze medal could reach Switzerland's Supreme Court. Attorney Howard Jacobs has argued on behalf of athletes in numerous such cases, and he joins the show to provide some unique insight on what recourse the U.S. has, what its chances are, and what happens if Childs just decides to keep the medal anyway. I'm joined now by attorney Howard Jacobs. Welcome, Howard. Hello. Great to have you on. I think you can provide a lot of insight into this somewhat confusing situation. So the Court of Arbitration for Sport denied the U.S.'s appeal on Jordan Childs' medal. Were you all surprised at that decision? I mean, from what I've read, it, it's a little hard to tell. I mean, the whole situation is tragic for all of the athletes involved. Uh, I, I would have expected that they would have rejected the challenge uh, by the Romanians uh, because these types of things are not supposed to be fought out in a courtroom. They're supposed to be decided on the field of play. And there's a there's a legal doctrine in these cases. It's actually called the field of play doctrine, where arbitrators are not supposed to second guess what happened. And it very much from from what I've read seems like uh, like that's what has happened here is that they have by engaging in this debate over whether the protest was filed on time or not. And, you know, if it was filed a day late, okay, that would be a different situation. But if it's 
the question of whether it's filed within a minute or it's four seconds late or it's 12 seconds before the deadline. I mean, to me, that all seems like the type of thing that should fall within the field of play doctrine. And so that, that they should not have stepped in and, uh, and changed the result. Okay, interesting. I mean, not really knowing the specific nuances of the situation just feels like one of those scenarios where you don't expect the ruling to be overturned. As someone who has argued any, any number of these cases, is there a pretty high burden of proof to get an entity like CAS to reverse what happened on the field of play? There is. I mean, generally, if it's a field of play decision, it's only going to be reversed if it's beyond the authority of the referee to make in the first place or if the decision is based on fraud or corruption or things like that. Uh, none of those seem to apply here. I mean, I, I would guess that they're going to say, well, it was beyond the authority of the, the referee uh, because the, the challenge was four seconds late. But as I said, my view of it is if it's that close uh, and, and it seems like there's a dispute over whether it was actually filed on time or not, that very dispute to me seems like something that you shouldn't be second guessing. And particularly in a situation where it has to be done as quickly as it was, you know, I don't know what the evidence was that was submitted that it was four seconds late. I don't know what the evidence that they tried to submit after the hearing was that shows that it was on time. But the fact that that's a, you know, a debated factual issue, as I said, to me, leads to the, the conclusion that it shouldn't be something that cash should be weighing into. And yeah, I was going to ask about that. You know, the USAG is now saying, actually, we have evidence that it was at 47 seconds, not 64 seconds. Is that something where Cass could weigh that? Or is that be if it becomes a kind of he said, she said thing, are they likely to just say, we're just going to stay out of this and deny any appeals? It's yeah, that's hard to say. Uh, just, you know, being on the outside and, and trying to guess what actually happened a little bit based on reading the stories. I mean, I, I understand that once the case is done, if USA Gymnastics was basically asking them to reopen the case on new evidence, it does not appear that there's any clear procedure to do that. And my understanding is that that is the reason that Cass said we're not going to take this new evidence. But but I, you know, I, I would have questions as to you know, what was the evidence that was submitted in the first place? And, uh, you know, if it was undis if, if Cass was only seeing the one side and, and the, the, the only evidence that they had was that the appeal was late, um, then, then maybe you can, you can see it. But again, I mean, I have to imagine that USA Gymnastics would have challenged that at the first hearing, whether they had the additional evidence or not. Uh, I would have to imagine it's something that they challenged. Yeah. And speaking of USA challenging this, they can now take this up to the Switzerland Supreme Court. Do you have any precedent? Do you know of any precedent for something like that? The, the challenge before the Swiss Federal Tribunal would be on, on very limited grounds. So the Swiss Federal Tribunal is not going to hear new evidence. It's more of a procedural challenge. And, uh, you, you know, that and that would probably that would obviously be a Swiss lawyer presenting that uh, to the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Those challenges are, are difficult to win. Uh, you know, they, they are filed, I wouldn't say routinely, but there have been quite a few of them filed and the statistics are generally not great. Yeah. And so that wouldn't be a scenario where the U.S. can say, but look, the cast ignored our 47 second video, but you, the Swiss Tribunal, you can now look at this. That's not really in play here. If they have some procedural arguments that, you know, like, for example, if they had maybe asked for a delay so that they could obtain the evidence and the delay was denied, you know, that that would be maybe the type of thing that the Swiss Federal Tribunal would hear. But they're not going to be able to the Swiss Federal Tribunal, in my opinion, come in and say, oh, look at this new evidence that we have that we weren't that we didn't present. They're not going to entertain that. Yeah. And if the U.S. kind of runs out of options here, you know, loses everywhere they try, but then Jordan Childs just puts the medal in a safe deposit box and says, I'm not giving it back. What does the IOC do in that scenario? That's a good question. I would be surprised if that happens. Um, so I'd, I'd rather not weigh in on that. Okay, fair enough. Um, and just asking for a little bit of conjecture here, but the IOC in some scenarios has just given out an additional medal. They don't seem willing to do that here with Romania's Anna Barbosu. 
do you, why don't you think they take that step? That's a good question. I mean, I, everybody, there are a lot of people have drawn parallels to the Salt Lake situation. I mean, possibly the difference there was there's some evidence or at least allegation of corruption in the officiating, whereas this seems to be more mistake than corruption. Uh, so, so maybe that's the difference, but, but I don't know it for, again, from what I've read, it seemed like all sides were, except for the IOC would have agreed on uh, granting an additional medal. And the IOC is the one that said, no, it'd be interesting to try to find out why. Yeah. Where my mind goes is that they don't want to establish some precedent where people start complaining and they just say, okay, everyone gets a medal. Right. You, you everyone right. get, you know, take your goodie bag. So yeah, I feel like they want to keep their standards, but obviously the U.S. is going to fight this as much as they can, at least to show their team that they're on their side. Do you see this resolving as just Childs is asked to return the medal and that's the final word? I mean, unfortunately, I think that's the most likely result at this point. I mean, I'm sure that USA Gymnastics will do everything that's available to them. The U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee has said that they are going to appeal it as well. Uh, and, and they may have a, the separate ability to do that. I think that's going to largely depend on uh, what notice they had of the first CAS hearing and whether they, you know, had, if they had notice and chose not to participate, I think maybe it's going to be harder for them to file a new appeal. But if they didn't have proper notice, then they may be able to do this before the court of arbitration for sport. It's going to be on a longer timetable though. All right. Very insightful. Howard Jacobs, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. Conor McGregor is not returning to the UFC yet. Dana White said on Tuesday that he talked to McGregor recently and that the two-time UFC champ wants to fight, but that he won't fight this year. McGregor is one of the most decorated fighters in the history of UFC and was the first to win a championship in two separate weight classes simultaneously. He broke his leg in a fight against Dustin Poirier in 2021 and has long hinted at a return to the UFC before 2024 ended. He was supposed to fight Michael Chandler in June, but that fight was postponed after McGregor broke his toe. In terms of a return timeline, White told reporters, we'll figure it out. Uniform sponsorships have reached collegiate sports. Grace College, an Indiana institution with about 800 total students, has made history by becoming the first college ever to incorporate uniform patches. The school agreed to a three-year deal with Zimmer Biomet to feature its logo on all uniforms for both men's and women's sports. Grace falls under the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics umbrella. The NAIA is made up of about 250 schools and calls themselves the experts in the business of small college athletics. They are the first collective to vote in favor of NIL and also voted in favor of allowing jersey sponsorships this past April. A historic moment in college sports, led by Grace College. Up next, my colleague Colin Salau spoke with Atlanta Dream Senior VP Dan Gadd on the WNBA's new media rights deal, the growth of the league, how the Olympic break has been for him as an executive, and what he expects in the second half of the season. That conversation is coming up. All right, this is Colin Sala, a reporter with Front Office Sports' newsletter team. And we are joined by Dan Gad, the Senior Vice President for Growth with the WNBA's Atlanta Dream. Dan, thank you for joining us. Absolutely, Colin. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about, you know, previewing the WNBA, the second half of the WNBA season, which starts today. But before that, you guys had basically a month off. As a front office exec, what does that break look like? Is that a break or is that working? So we, we, we did have, you know, obviously with the, with the growth of the league, we had a, a very, uh, a very busy first half of the year trying to really, I mean, honestly, keep up with demand in some ways. And that, that added a lot to the play. So we did, we did get the, the whole staff a week off, which was fantastic. But outside of that, I will say like, we, we were not lacking for things to do while we were on break. We, we rolled out our 2025 renewals and, and, and new season tickets and, you know, we've still got a game coming up here at State Farm, which I'm sure we're going to talk about soon. And we just a number of initiatives going on. So we, we try to use that time as much as possible to catch up and, and get ahead of some things. But we were uh, we, we there was no lack of things for us to do during the break. I can only imagine. I mean, obviously, it was the Olympics. I hope you had time to watch. But Absolutely. Of course, um, there's still a full a whole half of the season to go. And you already mentioned it here. You mentioned strong demand. Obviously, this year has been monumental for the WNBA. Um, but a lot, you know, it's it's not it's fair to say I think that a lot of it has come from yes growth over the last few years, but also mm -hmm. this new rookie class. Um, and I'm curious on your side, you, you know, you you don't have a Caitlin Clark or an Angel Reese, but I'm sure you're still yeah. feeling these positive effects. 
Um, what is the visible proof that you've seen quantitatively or even qualitatively of that growth? Oh, without a doubt, like in every way, shape and form, this has been, we, we refer to it a lot as a pattern breaking year. And what I mean by that is from the moment that Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese particularly announced for the draft, like our, our, we do a very good job of data collection and, and, and trying to like make sure we reach out and, and capture the interest and, and follow that up with, with, uh, you know, season ticket offers and things like that. And from the minute that they declared for the draft, our, our website went crazy and, and the number of leads coming in was fantastic. So, you know, yeah, you can point to some games where the ceiling has gone, you know, unbelievably high on some of these games, but additionally, like from a season ticket base, you know, this past year, we sold out of season tickets for the first time in franchise history and, and had to cap it because there were some other things that we wanted to do. And uh, that allowed us to start a, a waiting list and allowed us to really, really give us a lot of options on, on things that we wanted to do in the back half of the year. Um, but, but to your point, yeah, like additionally, like now we've got these, these games that just have tremendous, tremendous demand. And so that's been a lot of, you know, a lot of what we did during the break was, was really forecasting 2025 and figuring out how do we now play in this new kind of atmosphere where you we're really looking at like almost four tiers of games and, and what flexibility do we have to build in going into next year? So, so without a doubt, it's had a huge impact on the league. Additionally, you know, TV ratings are, are really, really high. Just general awareness of the league is much higher than it was. And it's great for us to, to, to have these, even if it's not us playing in the games, having these big TV games and driving more awareness. But additionally, you know, we, we also renegotiated a, a media deal here locally because the teams all do their own media deals. And uh, we have great partners in Peachtree TV here. And our, our numbers are just way, way, way higher than last year. So you know, we, this has been a three-year growth process for us. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So this isn't just one year. We've we've really had tremendous growth, starting really with the the new ownership group coming in in 2021, and then going into 2022, really having to be able to staff up and and do some things differently to drive awareness in the market. And so I'll talk more about this later. But we this has been like really year three or four of what has been a, a, a very very strong growth rate. And and but this has definitely been different and just you know. Just anecdotally, I've worked in sports for a very long time. I've worked at three NFL teams. I've never seen a year-over-year -year change in sports like this, and 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 how to hand and how to handle that's been one of the biggest questions. So it's it has been a phenomenal year with a lot of great problems to solve. Yeah, that sounds. Again, congratulations to the, to the growth that you guys are experiencing. I think congratulations to you guys and the league right now for what's going on. I want to talk about sponsorships. I want to talk about venues, but I'll, I'll pull back a little bit because we're talking about twenty twenty five. I want to look at the, the, this next half of the year um, and what's what's happening for the, the rest of the year because of, of course it's it's not all the time that you see this long break and lull mm -hmm. in the, in the middle of the year. Do you think that's going to have any effect? How are you guys projecting that potential effect? Especially not just because there's a break, but also because you know fall sports season is starting for other you know leagues. I am not worried about a break in momentum. I'll put it that way. Um, we I'm not losing any sleep over that. We. You know, we the the women's team won gold. The women's three on three team with our Ryan Howard won bronze. So that, that it's not like we've just became irrelevant overnight. Like that that all you know helps with everything that, that we have for the back half of the year. But additionally, you know, from our side, we're getting a, a really a, a in the first half of the year we had very very significant injuries. So with Jordan Canada, Ryan Howard, and others, we're gonna for the first time coming out of the break, we're gonna have a full healthy lineup. And that is a lot of reason. So we're right on the cusp of the playoff um, seating. And that's that should give us a lot of momentum here. So we have the back half of the stretch, a playoff run with a healthy lineup. And we're going to be playing our best basketball. And oh, by the way, we've also sold out our first 13 games. And we're trying to close in on closing up the selling out the final seven to get to 20 for 20 for sellouts. So we're, we're not we're not concerned at all about a lack of momentum. We see a lot of opportunity. And like, as I mentioned, you know, the TV ratings are significantly better this year. And I, I think the Olympics, are, you know, if you look at how this started, it really started with the momentum of women's college basketball, right? There were some great things that happened there. So, so having an Olympic break, I don't think hurt us at all. Cause again, the women team, the women's team winning gold does not, is, is, is a good thing for us as well. You know, one of the big things that also happened over this um, break, like very early, very soon after the break started was the, the media rights deal, the national media rights deal that was signed mm -hmm. by the NBA with its three new partners. And then obviously the WNBA is looped into that deal. This obviously, you mentioned the local media rights deal earlier, but this one mm -hmm. is the national one. When, when you're looking at that, what was your reaction and how does that affect, you know, one singular franchise like, like the Dream? 
Yeah, that's a great question and a hugely, hugely important piece for the league. And really, there, there were a couple of things that immediately, you know, you want to go see, especially somebody in my position, you want to see is number one, does it raise the floor? Does it does it meet where we are right now and and raise the value of the entire league and and, and generate the type of revenue, to be frank, that, that we think we deserve and with the right partners, right? So that we're getting the right visibility and, and continuing to grow this thing. And then number two, when you, when you talk about an 11 year deal, you know, the next thing you want to know is, hey, does it give the flexibility for us to reevaluate as we go and, and account for the growth of the league? If we continue to grow at this rate, right, that thing could have become obsolete pretty fast. So, so this one does after three years, it gives us the ability to reevaluate that. So those two factors in my book were, were, uh, were very strong. And, and so that, that's great. And then, you know, I think a lot of things that don't get talked about enough is there's other media rights to sell. There, there's still room for uh, additional partners to come on board. And, you know, again, working on the team side, it, it just as important for us is who's that media partner for us and what does that look like for us? And, and are we are we continuing to grow the viewership in our own market on our local games? And so when you look at it as part of that whole framework, yeah, I think it's I think it's a strong deal and, it, and it, it's going to great. It, it allows us to 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 both raise the bar right now and continue to grow over time. And, and that's all you can ask for. It's been great to talk to you. It's been great to to see the league grow the way that it has. And I'm sure that we're going to have a conversation maybe in a few months or in a year. And it's going to be interesting to see just how much growth that it's going to get at that point um, and even beyond that. Thank you, Colin. It was great. The Intuit Dome, the long-awaited home for the Los Angeles Clippers, is making its grand opening today. The new arena is located right in the middle of Inglewood and is within two miles of both SoFi Stadium and the Kia Forum. Steve Ballmer, the Clippers governor, said that he wants the Intuit Dome to be a basketball mecca and is focused on making every fan feel as close to the action as possible. One of the hallmarks of this new arena is The Wall, 51 uninterrupted rows reserved for hardcore Clipper fans. The Intuit Dome also features the largest double-sided halo display with over an acre of video boards so that fans can see the action from anywhere in the stadium. The site is starting its run with back-to-back -back concerts from Bruno Mars tonight and tomorrow. They'll host the 2026 NBA All-Star Game and be featured in the 2028 Olympic Games. Yesterday, officials broke ground in Raleigh, North Carolina on what is going to be the largest racket sports facility in the world. Swing Racket and Paddle is investing $100 million into the site and expects the facility to bring in over a million visitors each year. The 44-acre facility will feature 28 tennis courts, 25 pickleball courts, 15 paddle courts, beach tennis and volleyball courts, a ping pong lounge, and a nature trail. It will even feature a restaurant run by top chefs Fabio Viviani, who will curate the food and beverage options located at the site. Mondo Duplantis made a name for himself at this year's Olympics winning the gold medal in pole vaulting and setting his ninth world record in the sport. Carsten Warholm, a Norwegian hurdler and silver medalist in the 400 meters hurdles, is the world record holder for the fastest 400 meter hurdle time. Being the best at their individual sports wasn't enough for the two, and now they'll be facing off against each other next month in a 100-meter dash. This has been in the making for about a year, all stemming from a social media clip where the two athletes were asked if they would consider racing one another. Now it's got real legs, and the one-on-one -on -one seems like it will be a close one. Warholm's record 100-meter sprint time is 10.49, while Duplantis checks in at 10.57 seconds. The peril race in Zurich's Litzegrun Stadium on September 4th. And here's Houston Astros slugger Jordan Alvarez denying any responsibility through a translator when a batting practice moonshot of his damaged the Tampa Bay Rays scoreboard. Did you uh, shooting for the scoreboard or what was going on there? Well, tú me estás poniendo un problema porque yo soy de que lo posteaste y si no hay un video que fuera de lo que yo, ese bill no lo pago yo. No, you're, you're trying to get me in trouble. You're the one that posted that, that, <laughs> that picture. There wasn't a video showing that it was me. I don't know what it was, so I'm not paying that bill. <laughs> That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell your friends who you think would like it too. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.